Saints. Welcome Grace Tribe. My name is Mike Daniel if you haven't tuned in with us before. Normally we're live but uh, this morning I wanted to share with you a nugget if you will and I needed to pre-record it because I'm on my way to do uh, to preach at a, a local church in, um, in the hill country in Texas. And so I wanted to share with y'all a nugget this morning. I was out on a run today and there are a lot of deer in the neighborhood where I live. And so as I was out on my run, what the deer do in this season when they're having their fawns is they will plant a very weak newborn fawn in deep grass or in some brush where it's a little hard to see, and then uh, they will leave it there. And people find these little fawns all the time going, oh no, it's been abandoned. No, what the deer are doing is they're actually leaving them somewhere place relatively safe so that as they wander around and look for food, uh, for them and for their newborn, uh, any predators that find them, they're likely to be able to outrun, but the little fawn couldn't. So the safest thing that they can do is leave the fawn hidden and try to draw predators away from them. So as I was on a run this morning, I'm, you know, trucking along, and uh, I see a bunch of deer hop out of brush and kind of run ahead of me along the path. And because I already know this and have witnessed this in years past, I realize they have uh, a fawn hidden or two or three or five hidden, not one deer, but several deer hidden in the brush that they just hopped out of in the trees that I was running by. And so they've hopped out and ran ahead of me in the hopes that if I'm a predator, I will chase them and they'll draw me away from a much more tender, defenseless newborn. And it's just the season that we're in. We see the little fawns learning to walk and scurrying around and almost falling over and they still are covered in white spots and they're adorable and so I know it's that season I've seen them all around and so when the deers uh, hopped out in front of me and ran ahead of me I thought ah they're leading me away from something tender and fragile and defenseless and you know, I think that's just what we do in the Christian life. Or, well, just as humans, not even Christians. I think we've developed all kinds of coping mechanisms and defensive responses and uh, uh, over-responding in some ways to try to detract and detour and redirect and misdirect people from the most tender issues of our life. Where we've been hurt before, where we are uh, afraid someone will see a, our deepest flaw, so we overcompensate by overachieving in some areas of our life, or some people lash out in a rage because they think someone might have smirked at them when they walked by, or uh, people pull over their cars and attack one another uh, verbally, usually, hopefully, uh, because they're insulted somehow by a look or a stare or being cut off. And it's not worth that. It's an over-response. And the reason people are over-responding is because it's a defense mechanism. They are trying to misdirect and redirect and, and be protective of some weak, feeble, tender, vulnerable part of their life. So they build up um, these kinds of defense mechanisms. Uh, they, they may overcompensate with areas of strength for areas of weakness. They may redirect uh, laying blame or hiding problems or avoiding something. And it's because they don't feel like they can afford, they don't have the fortitude to withstand exposure of their most tender issues. I was running along the road uh, a while back. This was, I don't know, a year ago. And I, I, as I'm you know, about to cross a road, there's a car that's coming up to a four-way stop, and he slows down just a little bit until he realizes he can go in front of me. I'm crossing the road, he's coming up to a stop sign, and he floors it and goes right by me, and he, he overestimates the turn, so he has to cut it shorter, narrower than he thought, and he all but clipped me. So I do this as his mirror goes by and barely misses me, and I, I'm kind of like, ah! And he drives by, so he ran the stop sign, he's going 
50, he makes the corner, but he has to cut me off, almost hits me with his mirror, and takes off down the, the adjacent road, and I'm shocked and stunned and flabbergasted, and, you know, had done this to avoid getting hit, because I was running this way, and he, you know, I, I do this, and, uh, it's, you know, he blazes on out of there, and I just keep running, and uh, I go to my turnaround point, the end of my run, I turn around, and I'm running back, and when I get back into my closer-to-home neighborhood, uh, he's coming from another direction, same car, and he yanks his car over and slams on his brakes and throws open his door and he comes straight at me. Did you have a problem with me running that stop sign? Did you take issue with me? You got a problem with me doing that? I could see you. I wasn't going to hit you. He just immediately over-responded. I never said a word. I just, uh, when he went around, I, you know, I just dodged his uh, mirror and I think he thought I was... I don't know, yelling at him, or uh, I didn't even know he was going to run the stop sign. I didn't have time to think about yelling at him. But he was so defensive that if anyone had any problem with anything he ever did, he had to over-respond in some sort of strange rage. And it was just so obvious that he's overcompensating for a very deep need to be self-justified in everything that he did, that even someone being bothered that he would run a stop sign or almost run over them or run over kids in a neighborhood, he would have to be justified and not just justified to himself, but he would have to force his opinion on everyone else. No one could question him. And that's how people respond. These over-responsive, either negative flesh patterns like that guy or positive flesh patterns like what I grew up with, trying to be so good in some areas that no one ever sees your weaknesses and struggles and foibles and temptations and, and uh, you know, sinful patterns or whatever. That, that they're, they're, the good is so good that no one sees the bad. Or you think... Uh, you're upset with something about me, I'm going to over-respond with something even worse so that you never dig into why I would ever do that. That's almost like a bad response to his own guilt and remorse for having done it. He overcompensates because he can't afford to be to have done anything wrong in anyone's mind. This is how the human nature is forced to operate apart from the indwelling life of Christ. We're so desperately needy for justification to be okay, for safety. We're like those deer who will do anything to lead people away, even to their own detriment, from the most fragile, injurious, needy, vulnerable places of their heart. Well, God said something really interesting through the Apostle Paul in Ephesians chapter 3. Uh, he says, I kneel before the Father, this is in Ephesians 3, uh, beginning in 15, from whom his whole family in heaven and on earth derives its name. I'm talking to God. In verse 16, he says this, Ephesians 3, 16, I pray that out of his glorious riches, right, his enoughness, not that you have enough in and of yourself, but that out of his riches, glorious riches, watch this that he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being, that we might be strong because of his glorious riches with which he strengthens us from his presence by his spirit in our inner being, that his strength around our weakest, most fragile issues would prove sufficient out of his glorious riches. Verse 17, watch this. So that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. In other words, I could trust him enough that I could choose to allow him to dwell. That word dwell, uh, it's the same word from which we get abide, uh, where uh, John wrote uh, his gospel. And he's not saying exist or live. He's saying that Christ would dwell. Christ is already in the Ephesian believers that Paul is writing to. He's saying that Christ could actually inhabit and be active from the inside out. Not just exist there, but actually be living powerfully from the place of their innermost being. 
not all living is equal, right? I can live with Christ in me or Christ can live in and through me and that may seem like semantics and of course he is living, but it is my willingness, my trust of his trustworthiness that allows him to take over and live through me because the, uh, the, the prophecy is subject to the prophet, right? The, the, the individual does not have to allow the spirit to move powerfully through them. God wants us to participate with his work out from within us. So he's asking us to, to be strengthened in our innermost being by his spirit out of his glorious riches that we would have enough power to trust God to actually live powerfully through us. Now, he just keeps going. I pray through it, so that's all through faith. In other words, our allowing, our depending by faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, do you hear the security of that? This power of, of Christ in your inner being so that you can afford and have the security to entrust yourself to the spirits living through you. And then Paul goes on with that having happened, having been so established, so secure. I pray that you being rooted and established, that secure in that love, may have power together with all the saints. So now community enters into it. Not only am I trusting God enough to participate in my innermost being and live out from me because I can trust him, but because I'm that established and that secure, that rooted in his love and his power and his strength, Paul's praying that we would have power with all the saints. So now community can interact at the most authentic levels of our life. I pray that you being that rooted and established in love may have power together with all the saints to begin to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. That's the same love he's saying you would know you are rooted and established in. So he's talking about our security in our belovedness by Christ who is in us so that we can have the security to allow him to live powerfully through us. We can afford the vulnerability of Christ's spirit in us to commune with Christ's spirit in one another. This incredible vulnerability that Christ's indwelling life and love and establishment and rootedness affords us. So that's Paul's prayer. And he says that as we do that, we can begin to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ and to know this love that surpasses knowledge. See, you can't know what you can't know. But as he lives in me and loves through me and I'm established in his love enough to trust him to do that and you do the same thing, then we begin to experience from God through one another a divine love, a divine security, a divine uh, safety with one another that we could never have from the world, from the flesh, or even from one another apart from Christ. That you, having done that, right, that we would know his love together that surpasses knowledge. And here's the end game that Paul wants for the church. That you may be filled to the full measure of all the fullness of God. Wow. So the way you get to experience more of the fullness of Christ is to trust him enough to express that fullness through us, which means that we have to be vulnerable and honest enough with ourselves and with God and trust him enough in his love towards us to live through us in a way that would be vulnerable to us apart from how established and loved we are by him. So that as we allow him, as we trust him with our vulnerabilities, he lives through us with such powerful tenderness towards us that we can afford to let him love one another 
instead of responding with flesh mechanisms, instead of, you know, drawing attention over here so people don't see my weaknesses over here, we begin to have the divine affordability of the fullness of his grace so that as we begin to know this divine love through one another, we can actually be filled to overflowing by the love we receive and give from Christ through one another to a degree that we could never know that surpasses all of our imagining beyond any of our understanding because it's the fullness of Christ expressed uniquely through each of the members of the body of Christ. So I can know more through us than I could ever know just within me. You get to know Christ whom I uniquely know within me and in my context, and you begin uh, to express Christ to me in a way that you uniquely know and uh, can only express from your context. So we who begin to know Christ like no one else can know him because of our unique contexts can express him like no one else can express him. But then we begin to know the fullness of God through one another. And it requires the safety and security of how beloved and secure and established we are in him that we could begin to allow him out of our vulnerability with him that he would love us so much that that divine, powerful tenderness of God would inspire us to be able to afford to let him love one another, as I always say, like crazy, like only he can do in and through us. So I want you to go and read this passage from Ephesians 3. I read from about 14 through uh, 19, but really 20 is his big doxology. So read all the way to the end of the chapter and think about this divine tenderness that we can have by grace because of his uh, tender power, his powerful tenderness toward us, that he would protect us and establish us and secure us and give us power from our inner being so that we can afford to let him live and love through us in a way that apart from him, we could never afford to be exposed that way with one another. And that authenticity, that vulnerability allows us to express and receive the love of God in a way we could never experience apart from his life in you towards me and in me towards you. And as we let him do that, we get to know him more in us, right? His love through me for you, I get to experience for you. And so I participate in his divine life and get to know him as I depend upon him and grow in intimacy with him. So I can know him more. That's my prayer for you, that you would know him more as you let him live through you, that you would grow in his grace as you depend and trust on him and his grace prove sufficient. And then you will enjoy going and loving one another like crazy, like only Christ can do in and through us. Know him, grow in his grace, go love one another like crazy. No greater passage than loving each other like crazy than what he is describing of this love that is unknowable apart from Christ in you. The hope of glory, but also the hope of authenticity and security and power in your innermost being. That is the divine, powerful tenderness of the love of God for you. So I can't wait to share with y'all again. Uh, you're watching this on Sunday morning. I will be preaching uh, here in just a, a few minutes when you're watching this probably. And then on Monday morning, we'll be back at 6.45 a.m. for another devotional time with the Grace Tribe, drinking coffee and uh, talking grace and enjoying his life to his glory by his grace in one another. Love you guys. Talk to you soon.